Welcome back to Pathagonia. So in today's episode, we're going to talk a little bit about thyroid cytology. To thank you again to Kurt's notes. Um, so in my first week on cytopathology, we had a lot of thyroid FNA specimens. So it's good to review, um, and we're going to start out by going over the adequacy criteria. So let's say you're on a procedure. What do we need to see for the specimen to be considered adequate? So we must see at least six groups of well-visualized follicular epithelial cells, each consisting of at least 10 cells. So at least six groups of 10 cells, and they have to be well-visualized follicular epithelial cells. Um, some exceptions, or you can have abundant colloid with radiographic findings compatible with a colloid nodule, or abundant inflammation with a solid nodule, or atypia. So six groups of 10, or abundant colloid, inflammation, or atypia. And ideally, the follicular epithelium should be in a nice, big, flat, monolayered sheet with evenly spaced, honeycomb-like, dark round nuclei with uniformly granular chromatin. Next up, we've got benign follicular nodule, now known as follicular nodular disease, or FND. So FND, as the name would suggest, is a benign process. Uh, histologically, it can represent a nodular goiter, adenomatoid nodules, and colloid nodules. And there can be variable amounts of colloid, bland follicular cells, herthal cells, and macrophages. There should be sparse to moderately cellularity with a good amount of colloid, which is the easiest to see on DIFQUIC. Um, and the, at least two types of colloid that you can see, you can see this watery colloid here, which is thin, watery, like cellophane or you can see dense colloid, which is thick and like hyaline. Also, in this case, in uh, FND, you can see cystic degeneration, which is macrophages with or reparative stretch cells. Next up, we've got lymphocytic thyroiditis. So in lymphocytic thyroiditis, you're gonna see a hypercellular smear. So you're gonna see lots of cells with abundant polymorphic lymphocytes, which is what we're seeing here. And herthal cell metaplasia is common, which are large cells with abundant granular cytoplasm and prominent nucleoli. In advanced cases, it may be hypocellular due to fibrosis. And lymphocytic thyroiditis often occurs in middle-aged women with associated circulating autoantibodies. Next up, we've got granulomatous thyroiditis, also known as subacute or de Quervain's thyroiditis. And as the image would suggest, in this entity, you can see clusters of epithelioid histiocytes or granulomas in multinucleated giant cells, often ingesting colloid. This is a self-limited inflammatory condition, usually diagnosed clinically, and from what I recall, it is often painful. And early, early on, you can have neutrophils and eosinophils, and later on, you can have lymphocytes. So papillary thyroid carcinoma, certainly an entity to be familiar with. Uh, it's the most common malignant thyroid neoplasm with a relatively good prognosis that spreads via the lymphatics. So the classic findings in PTC, you're gonna see intranuclear pseudo-inclusions, which is what we see here. You're also gonna see a powdery pale chromatin with marginal micronucleoli. And you can have enlarged irregular nuclei you can have, of course, the longitudinal nuclear grooves. You can have dense squamoid cytoplasm, multinucleated giant cells, or dense bubblegum colloid. And as we see here, architecturally, you can often have papillary structures with and without fibrovascular cores. So papillary thyroid carcinoma, it would make sense that we're gonna see papillary architecture, right? And if you have some of the findings of PTC, but not enough to quite get to papillary carcinoma, consider AUS, or atypia of undetermined significance, or suspicious for malignancy. Moving on, you can have a follicular neoplasm, or suspicious for follicular neoplasm. And remember that on cytology, we cannot differentiate between a follicular adenoma and a carcinoma. You're going to need to see that capsule and you're going to need to see vascular invasion to make that diagnosis of adenoma or carcinoma. Carcinoma being if there is invasion and adenoma if there is not. So follicular neoplasm is 
often moderately or markedly cellular, with significant alteration in follicular architecture. You can have repetitive microfollicular patterns or cell crowding with overlapping intrabeculae. You can also have minimal colloid with minimal cytologic atypia. And don't forget about herthal cell lesions. In herthal cell lesions, you're going to want to look out for non-macrofollicular architecture, absence of colloid, absence of inflammation, and presence of transgressing blood vessels. So in this image on the right, you see microfollicles. And how do we know it's a microfollicle? Because each one has less than 15 cells arranged in a circle that is at least two-thirds complete. And that's how we define a microfollicle. And again, if you have some of the findings, but not quite enough, consider follicular lesion of undetermined significance, or FLUS. In the last page, we've got medullary carcinoma. Medullary carcinoma can be sporadic or inherited. It can be part of MEN2A or 2B, and it, this entity is derived from the parafollicular C cells and stains with calcitonin. Medullary carcinoma um, can often have moderate to marked cellularity, and it's often discohesive. They can be plasmacytoid, polygonal, and spindled cells with mild to moderate pleomorphism, and don't forget the salt and pepper chromatin. And occasionally, you can have intranuclear pseudo-inclusions or amyloid fragments. So stains that could be useful are, again, calcitonin or even Congo red to stain that amyloid that you could possibly see. Next up, we've got undifferentiated or anaplastic carcinoma. This is extremely aggressive, as the name would suggest, and it has a very poor prognosis. Uh, classically occurs in older women with rapidly growing um, hard neck mass that can cause trouble breathing. Uh, undifferentiated or anaplastic carcinoma can have variable cellularity and it's often discohesive with epithelioid to spindled cells and large pleomorphic nuclei and it's often associated with necrosis and inflammation and you can see osteoclast like giant cells. So the All right, last but not least, we're going to finish up this thyroid mini lecture going over the Bethesda system and genetics for thyroid neoplasms. So with rare exception on FNAs, you should be able to classify them into one of the Bethesda categories, which we're about to go over. But if you have an equivocal AUS or FLUS case, consider sending it out for molecular testing. So we'll go over the table first and then we'll go over some genetics. So first up, we've got our diagnostic category, risk of malignancy and management. So category one entity is something that's unsatisfactory. So it doesn't meet that adequacy criteria that we talked about earlier. So if you recall, that's gonna be six groups of well, 10 well-visualized follicular epithelial cells or abundant colloid, abundant inflammation, or atypia. So if it doesn't have any of that, then it's going to be unsatisfactory or category one, and they're going to repeat the ultrasound guided FNA. Next up, what we hope to see, category two, that's going to be benign with a low risk of malignancy, and they're just going to get clinical follow-up. Category three is AUS or FLUS. Again, very low risk of malignancy. However, because we're not quite sure it's equivocal, we're gonna repeat FNA and or do molecular testing to get to a sure diagnosis for our patients. Category four is a follicular neoplasm with 15 to 30% risk of malignancy, and this is often gonna to lead to a lobectomy. Category five is suspicious for malignancy, and that's gonna be a near total or a total thyroidectomy. And then category six is malignant, um, with, which is gonna, going to, of course, lead to a thyroidectomy. So some genetics and then we're done. So for PTC, this is the MAP kinase pathway and you're gonna have BRAF, which is the most classic uh, PTCs are going to express a BRAF V600E mutation or RAS, which is associated with the follicular variant of PTC and with NIFT-P. So remember BRAF V600E and RAS and that RAS it's associated with a follicular variant and NIFP. 
For medullary carcinoma, remember that it expresses RET, or it's going to have a mutation in RET, and think MEN2A and MEN2B. For follicular neoplasms, RAS is most common with PAX8 and PPARG, as well as PTEN, which if you remember, PTEN is also associated with Calvin syndrome, just a fun fact. Um, and then also, you can have poorly differentiated and anaplastic carcinoma, which is the one that we talked about that was highly aggressive and can cause that hardened nodule, typically in older women. And the mutation is going to be TP53 or CTNNB1. And don't forget the others mentioned above. So that's it. Just a quick tour of thyroid cytology. Um, it's always helpful for me to review. And I hope you all enjoyed. If so, like and subscribe and enjoy your weekend. See ya.